Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Stats All Day with Dr. O'Day. My name is Connor O'Day, I'm a professor at Union College, and we're going to be checking out how to run an independent samples t-test today. So before I get started, please make sure to hit that like and subscribe, and also, as you go through this video, if you have any questions, or if there's a video that you'd like to see coming up, please let me know in the comments below, it really helps support the channel. So let's go ahead and get started. So the data that I'm working with today is some data that I ran about a year to a year and a half ago. This was a study that I ran, and it hasn't been published yet. Um, I, I've been a little bit too busy to write up this particular study, but right now it's the focal point of my research because of the Roe v. Wade decision that just came out by the Supreme Court. Actually, when I originally ran this study examining attitudes toward abortion, we were more using abortion as a, a means of examining kind of biases that people might have according to their own beliefs, kind of the motivated cognition that people might have. And when we first ran this study, again, it's, it's pretty relevant right now, but when we first ran this study, we were presenting participants with um, a, a country who had laws about abortion that either made abortion entirely illegal, so very restrictive policies, or policies that made abortion more pro-choice, less more lenient, less restrictive policies, and we were examining people's attitudes toward those. Did people perceive those as appropriate? And so, again, there's two groups in this, there's a little bit more to this study, but this, this gives me the opportunity to kind of run some data using an independent samples t-test here. So I'm going to double click here on this laws variable. So again, we coded this as laws being legal or illegal. So half the people are seeing the laws being legal, half the people are seeing abortion as illegal. And then we had a number of items here measuring per participants' perceptions of that as appropriate. So I think it was about a 16-item scale. I calculated an average that's at the end of the data set here. So let's go ahead and run an independent samples t-test. So the way that you're going to do this is you're going to click up here in the top left on t-tests. And it gives you a nice labeling here. Jamovi is, and by the way, this is Jamovi. Um, I'm going to run stats in other programs as well and post them to this channel. But my preference right now, is, especially for students, is Jamovi. So we're going to click Independent Samples T-Test here. So then you just got to find your predictor variable or your grouping variable, your independent variable, if you will. And so we're going to scroll down until I see that laws variable. So I'm going to put that in as the grouping variable. And we're going to scroll down a little bit more. I said at the end of the data file was that calculated value of how appropriate participants are perceiving these laws. And you'll see here, Jamovi is awesome. It automatically is spitting out the output here. Um, and let's take a quick look at what's being shown here. I'm going to go ahead and just grab this and put it into Word so that I can blow this up just a little bit bigger so that hopefully it's easier for you to see. So I'm just going to blow this up a little bit more here. And let's go ahead and put this actually into landscape as well. So what this is telling us is we're running this as students T. Um, and this is giving us our T statistic is 8.27. Now that's a pretty high T statistic. Typically we start to see, you know, some of you might be familiar with the word statistical significance. Typically we start to see statistical significance when that T statistic is hitting about two or three. Um, so this is definitely probably going to be significant here. The degrees of freedom in this particular study are 292, and your p-value is less than 0 0.001. So we know at this point that there is a significant effect here. There is a significant difference between those two conditions, the restrictive laws and the more pro-choice laws. And so let's go ahead and start to write this up because I think that it's really helpful to think about how are we going to report this in a peer-reviewed publication. So I'm just going to come down here. I'm going to go ahead and start typing. Oh. So I'm going to say there was a significant effect of laws on how appropriate participants perceived the laws to be. I'm going to highlight that and just make that a little bit bigger here. So there's a significant effect of 
laws on how appropriate participants perceive the laws to be. And I'm just going to put a comma now because we need to insert these statistics that we're seeing into this write-up. And so I'm going to do a comma. I'm going to do an italicized T. So the way that we report a T statistic, and kind of the rule of thumb here is that if it's not a Greek letter, like alpha, then we're going to italicize that. So if it's a T, we italicize it. And I can't think of a situation where that's not done. So that's a good rule of thumb for you to follow. So T with 292 degrees of freedom is equal to 8.27. So that's your T statistic that I'm getting right here. And I'm going to do another comma. And I'm going to give my P value. And I'm going to say less than 0 0.001. Now, some of my students I've seen in the past put an equal sign before this. You don't actually need that equal sign. It's just P is less than 0 0.001. Now you might be wondering, why don't we put P is equal to 0 0.000? Because, you know, as of right now, this would be 0 0.000. Well, the reason being is that a P value is never, ever actually the exact value of zero. At some point in this long, like there might be a long decimal here, at some point there's going to be a number. Your p-value is never going to be zero because that would mean that there's no margin of error in your study. There's always error in science. And so there's always going to be a decimal somewhere in that length of, of decimal places there. So at this point we know that there is a significant effect, but we're missing some stuff still. We don't know which law people perceived was better. We don't even know what the means or the standard deviations are. And most importantly, we don't know how big this effect actually is. I mean, it's starting to look like our t-statistic is fairly large, but that could be influenced by sample size. This is a fairly large sample. I mean, we're talking over 290 people were in this study, and it's just a simple t-test. So that's quite a few participants for a simple t-test. Usually you'd want about 100. Um, you know, at least 50 people per cell is what people, at least in social psychology, which I'm a social psychologist, that's what people are suggesting now. So let's jump over to Jamovi and get a little bit more information about these effects. Next thing that I want to know is the effect size. Now, by default, it's going to give you Cohen's D as the effect size. And this actually tells you how many standard deviations different those two means are. It's a great, it's, it's called a standardized effect size. And it's telling you how many standard deviations apart these two means are. Now, typically, in psychology, we start to get excited around a Cohen's D of 0.5. And Cohen has actually published some, you know, this was a couple decades ago, um, but Cohen's actually published some rough guidelines for, you know, a small to medium to large effect. These guidelines are a little bit on the small side for me. Um, typically, these are, get reported in stats textbooks as a small effect being 0.2 Cohen's D, a medium effect being about 0.3 to 0.35, and a large effect being 0.5. I typically tend to get excited around a Cohen's D of 0.5, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, but right now, we're seeing a Cohen's D of 0.96. This, is, this means that your, your two averages, those two groups, are almost an entire standard deviation apart on this skill. That's a pretty darn big effect. So that's a pretty big effect there. Let's go ahead and see what the means actually are because at this point we still don't know which mean is larger than which. So now we have to come to our descriptives. So we're going to click descriptives and I actually like to click descriptive plots as well. It, it kind of gives you a little plot of this and that way you can see when the laws legalized abortion, by the way, this is real data, so I will be publishing this at some point. I will be submitting this for publication. This is real data here. This is not fictitious. I haven't doctored this data file at all. You know, sometimes for my stats classes, I might, you know, mess with the data file a little bit so that they have stuff to report. This is an unmessed with data file. This is absolutely real data here. Um, and what we're finding is that prior to, this was again a year and a half ago, so this was prior to the Supreme Court overruling Roe v. Wade. This was kind of before people had even talked about overturning Roe v. Wade. That happened in about April of this year when that the whispers started to get out about the Supreme Court possibly overturning that. What we're seeing is that the average here when the laws were legalizing abortion, so less restrictive laws, we saw that the average was almost a 5 on that 1 to 7 scale. It's a 1 to 7 scale here. 
um, seven being more appropriate, one being less appropriate laws. And then we see that the average for making abortion illegal was about a three, a little bit over a three down there. So it does seem like people are preferring laws that make abortion legal to laws that make abortion illegal. And we see here that there was 145 people in the legal group. There was 149 people in the illegal group. So we have roughly similar numbers of people in those two groups. And just as, just as a quick side note here, since this is probably one of the first statistics that many of you are learning, typically we want at least 50 people per group. And we want them to be roughly equal. It's okay if these numbers are not exactly equal. In fact, they can range from about a 3 to 1 ratio. So if one group had 50 people, you wouldn't want the other group to have more than 150 people. That's kind of a rough guideline there. Again, it's a rough guideline. It might be okay if you go a little bit over that. But typically, you want about a 3 to 1 ratio or less. We see that the mean, like we we're seeing down here, of the legal group was 4.84. The mean of the illegal group was 3.10. And so what we would say here is we want to add more information to this Word document. We want to add more information to this Word document. And I'm going to go ahead and kind of minimize that and pull this over. And we're going to say specifically our results showed that participants perceived the legal laws. And then I'm going to go ahead and put the mean and the standard deviation here. So we're going to italicize the M again. So the mean is equal to 4.84. And then I'm going to give the standard deviation. And I'm going to italicize that as well. Standard deviation is equal to 1.73. I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so that you can see all of that. Specifically, our results showed that participants perceived the legal laws to be more appropriate than the illegal laws. And I'm going to go ahead and do a capital M italicize there. So 3.10 comma standard deviation in italics again, 1.87, and then we're done. Um, actually, we're not quite done here. We want to add Cohen's D to this effect. So I'm going to do comma. Again, it's a non-Greek letter, so we're going to italicize and do a lowercase d. So d is equal to 0 0.96. Now, some of you might be wondering, why did I put the 0 in front of this decimal, but not in front of this p-value? Typically, the rough guidelines here, and not every journal follows these guidelines, but this is my preferred for sure, is that when the value can go above 1, you put the 0 in front of it. Cohen's D, you could be more than one standard deviation different, so we put the 0 in front of it. But a p-value is capped at 1. A p-value can take on anything between 0 and 1. Because that's capped at 1, we don't put the 0 in front of it. And the last thing that we could include here, and this is a little bit more up to you at this point in the field, I suggest doing it. There's a few journals out there that absolutely require it. Not all journals right now are requiring this, but again, I suggest that you do it, is you ask for the confidence interval. Now make sure to hit the confidence interval for the mean difference, not the confidence interval for the effect size. Now you could get a confidence interval for the effect size as well, um, but what most journals are going to have you report is the mean difference confidence interval. So let's talk about what this means. So this is giving you, this is saying the 95% confidence interval ranges from 1.33 to 2.16. And what that's telling us is that if we were to run this study an infinite number of times, we would be 95% confident, 95% confident, that's pretty damn confident, 95% confident that the actual population mean difference between these two groups. So again, we're taking group one minus group two. We're 95% confident that the actual real population difference between those two groups is somewhere between 1.33 and 2.16. So if we were to run this study an infinite number of times and take group one minus group two, 
we're 95% confident that that mean would fall somewhere in this interval. Now, how do we, we can actually use this interval to know if something is significant. If this interval does not include zero, then it's going to be a significant p-value. That's kind of how those confidence intervals work. So they're a little bit redundant with one another. However, the 95% confidence interval does give you a little bit more information. So let's go ahead and type that into our findings here. So after Cohen's D, I'm just going to put a comma. I'm going to do 95% and then I'm going to do italicized CI. Not everyone reports it in this exact way. Um, I, this is one that I haven't seen kind of an exact reporting of. I do it like this. Oops, I accidentally reduced my font size here. 95% um, confidence interval, and then I put brackets myself. I'm going to actually unitalicize those brackets, and I'm going to do 1.33, 1.33 comma, 2.16, and then I'm going to complete that bracket. Now you can kind of do that right up against the parentheses. You could space these out. I prefer to space them out. I think that it looks a little bit better. Sometimes I'll do it like this. Again, there isn't quite an exact rule of thumb when it comes to these. However, this is typically how I would do it myself and no journal has rejected a paper because I did it like this. So again, there was a significant effect of laws on how appropriate participants perceived the laws to be. You've got your t-statistics with your Cohen's D, your 95% confidence interval. Specifically, our results showed that participants perceived the legal laws to be more appropriate than the illegal laws. And that is what we would submit for publication. Now, we need a little bit more in our results section. So, you know, if we're formatting a results section here, You'd have the, re the word results above that. You'd want to talk through your hypotheses. So you'd want to say, I hypothesized that this would happen. To test this hypothesis, I ran an independent samples t-test. Consistent with my hypothesis or inconsistent with my hypothesis, there was a significant effect of laws. Now you're into it. And then finally, you want to make sure that you finish this out by giving the reader a takeaway. A nice clear message that describes what you found and it doesn't just reiterate the statistics that they're seeing here. So at this point, if you have any questions, please let me know below. I'm happy to answer those. I'm happy to make additional videos to help you out. Let me know, and have a great rest of your day.